No. I'm not worried at all. I rely on God, Allah. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to our next installment of the episode series on the rise of the Ottoman Empire. Now, uh, before we get started here uh, in uh, our subject material, I want to uh, ask us uh, a self-reflective question. Should we view current events and history through an Islamic lens? Now, while you're thinking about this question, I want to talk about a hadith that's narrated by Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu. And he said that uh, the people used to ask the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam about, uh, you know, the things that were good. But I used to ask him uh, about the evil out of fear that it would overtake me. Now, uh, he said uh, to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam once, Ya Rasulullah, you know, we were in a state of ignorance and evil. And now that we find ourselves in this time of good, will there be evil after this? And so Rasul Sallam said, yes. And he says, after that state of evil, after that period of evil, will we be in a state of good again? And so Rasul Sallam, he said, yes. You will, good will return, but it will have a defect in it. And then uh, Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then was asked by Hudayf al-Iman, then after that, uh, that good with that defect, will there um, be evil? He said, yes, there will be callers to the gates of hellfire. Whoever answers them will taste it from within. And so Hudayf ibn al-Yaman, he said, Ya Rasulullah, describe them to us. He says, they are from our progeny and speak our language. He says, what do you command me? Should that overtake me? And so Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, hold fast to the community of Muslims and their leader. I said, what if there is no community and there is no leader? Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, then withdraw from all of the different sects even if you must bite at the root of a tree until death overtakes you in that state. So should we look at history? Should we look at current events through an Islamic lens? Why or why, why not? What methodology should we choose? This hadith uh, narrated by Hudayfa bin al-Yaman radiallahu anhu, he uh, is inquiring to Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's looking at history and he acknowledges we were in a state of ignorance. We were in a state of jahiliya. We were in a state of evil. And that was confirmed by Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is now we're in a state of good. And then this period of good will be replaced by a period of evil. And that period of evil will be replaced by some good, but it will have a defect in it. And Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is giving Hudayfa bin al-Yaman some guidance, some perspective in how to view world events, how he should look at the world, how he should view history. Uh, Sheikh uh, Dr. Akram Dia, he says the interpretation of his Islamic history is derived from Islamic concept to the universe, mankind and life in general. It is based on the belief in Allah, his books, his messengers, the last day and the divine decree, whether good and bad, it is from Allah. It does not go beyond uh, Islamic faith and it is also based upon principles of conduct of the first Islamic society. A fact which distinguishes the course of Islamic history from that of secular world history due to the effect of the divine revelation within it. So uh, this particular scholar is saying that uh, there is a difference when we look at Islamic history because there's a presence of wahi. There's a presence of divine revelation. There's a presence of guidance by the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
And so when you look at history in general, when you look at world events in general, and you have hidayah, when you have guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you will view it in a completely different way than if you had a secularized view of history and current events. Because history can always be interpreted by different people uh, in different ways. Yet uh, there is a constant that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tries to get or that that uh, that human beings tr they try to uh, align themselves with this guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by looking at uh, some of the lessons that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us so how do we know what lessons we should learn from when we look at history how do we know how we should view things in our current state how do we know to prepare for the future uh it's a different lens. It's an Islamic lens. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in Surah Al-Ibrahim, for example, that this book, this Quran, which we have revealed unto you, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in order that you might lead mankind out of darkness into light by your Lord's leave to the path of the Almighty and the owner of all praise. So this book is a guidance from moving from darkness into light because then the lessons from history can be lost. The lessons that we would uh, appreciate from history can be completely um, foregone. We, we, we could actually live through many historical events uh, just as we're doing now. Many of the events that we're living uh, through now will be marked in history. And uh, can we learn from that during this period of time okay so um in uh surah al saad ayah 17 for example uh allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he tells our rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he says uh have patience at what they say and remember our servant daud a man with strength for he always turned to allah now, the secular benefits uh, or the secular lessons from history can be very different. So if somebody were to just look at it without any man-based perspective on history, if they looked at uh, the rulership or the history of Dawud of uh, David, they might get completely different lessons. But if we look at it from an Islamic uh, lens, we, we in this ayah are getting some lessons about Dawud salam. Now, firstly, uh, Allah is commanding the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to be patient, okay? So have patience. And uh, this is something now that is, you could say, a quality or characteristic trait that any leader needs to have is to have patience. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam have patience. And then we see here that um, uh, he's reminding the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about his servant Dawud alayhi salam. And Dawud alayhi salam, he calls him his servant. Which, uh, and we know that Dawud alayhi salam was one of the best human beings that ever lived. And at the time of Dawud alayhi salam, he's the best human being that lives. So the utmost honor that one could be called is a servant of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the highest level of honor that one can have. And if we look at other ayat in the Quran, Surah Al-Isra, Ayah 1, glory to be to Allah who did take his servant for a journey by night. Okay, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he elevates, he honors his servant. Now, here we see that uh, he's described, Dawud alayhi salam is described as a man with strength. Now, what does strength mean? What does power mean when we look at things through an Islamic lens? One might look at it from uh, a non, uh, you know, a non-Islamic lens by saying somebody's power is that they're able to do whatever they want. They're able to do anything with their desires. Okay, they're able to just fulfill any desire that they want. But what we see here is that true power is the execution of the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And weakness is the opposite of that. 
So a person is truly powerful, a person is truly strong, if they are able to themselves submit, right? So Islam means submit, so you're submitting to the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is true power. Uh, and if you're able to now, uh, to do that beyond that, now say if you're a person of influence within your sphere of influence, and we know Dawud salam also had a large sphere of influence, uh, being a king, that for him to be strong is that he can Im implement the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that is a person of strength, not a person who is just able to uh, fulfill any of, the, uh, of their desires, because then what happens? What does that mean? That means you become now a slave of your desires. And that does not truly mean that a person has strength. And uh, furthermore, uh, he, uh, why was he strong? Uh, why was he able? Uh, why was he uh, able to um, preserve himself, protect himself? Because he was always turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay. So firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now he's, he's telling the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, look at history. So let's break it down. He's saying, look at history. Look at, be patient. What are you upon? Whatever you're facing, be patient in what they say. And when we look at this now, we're looking at history because we're looking at the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then we appreciate that the best human being that ever lived on the face of the planet, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, had to endure uh, slander. He had to endure uh, this, uh, you know, all sorts of different types of rhetoric. He had to endure insults. He had to uh, endure rumors. He had to endure backbiting. Uh, he had to uh, endure this propaganda, this false campaign and, and false accusations. So he had to endure all of that. So if the best human being that ever lived had to endure all of those different things, then who are we not to be patient to endure those similar things? And did those things now cause, what, what did Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi what was he told now? When he was told to look at history as a lesson, as you're looking at it through an Islamic lens, was he told now that we should change, you're enduring all of these different insults and accusations. Okay, then try to appease them. Try to show uh, how much of a nice guy you are. Okay? No, inherently being merciful uh, and having certain ch characteristic traits you stay true to that. You don't try to pander to what people uh, uh, accuse you of or try to uh, respond to them. So looking at history, we look at our Rasul Sallallahu is then told for him, look at history. Look at Dawud Salam. Be patient against what they say and understand uh, how Dawud Salam was favored. Understand how Dawud Salam was elevated because he was a true servant to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So again, uh, if we look at other ayat in the Quran, for example, so again, Surah Al-Sad, ayat 21 to 24, there are these ayat that uh, talk about uh, these two men who entered upon Dawud salam, and they wanted Dawud salam to judge between them. And he was told that verily, this is my brother in religion. Uh, he has 99 ewes. Well, I only have one ewe. And he says, hand it over to me. And he, and he overpowered me in speech. And so Dawud salam said immediately without listening, he said, to the, uh, he said, he has wronged you in demanding your only ewe. So without listening to the other side, Dawud salam uh, is making this uh, judgment. Okay. And so... Uh, and so uh, the ayah goes on to say here, and verily many partners oppress one another except those who believe and do righteous good deeds, and they are a few. And Dawud guessed that we have tried him and sought forgiveness of his Lord, and he fell down prostration and turned into Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, turned towards Allah Subhanahu wa Taala in repentance. So here um, there are lessons when we look at this historical account of Dawud alayhi salam that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is focusing upon. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is putting a spotlight on an incident that occurred during the time of Dawud alayhi salam how to lead so he's being shown how to lead and how to judge uh, he's being shown that the difference between truth and falsehood that you need to listen you have to look at all sides to be able to ascertain the truth you don't immediately make a judgment you know subhanallah think about the era that we live in with social media people look at an opinion people look at a news article and immediately immediately they make a judgment right Immediately, they're given a piece of information. That's uh, the premise 
actually a lot of these late night shows and a lot of comedy shows. They'll bring a piece of news to a person and immediately, and it's fake news, right? So they'll say something, you know, to the fact that, uh, um, uh, you know, um, the president has now made like rainbows illegal, right? What's your comments on that, right? So, you know, and the people will be like, well, I don't think that's right. Like, you know, you look up to the rainbow and, you, you know, it's you, you, you get inspired. And how can you even control that? Like, you know, who's going to be put in jail? Like, so I could just imagine, like, the responses from people without even looking at, like, the issue. They're just told one thing and they're making a judgment. And that's probably 99% uh, of how people respond on social media and generally, right? They get a piece of information, they're throwing something, and they immediately make a judgment, Okay. Can you imagine historically now the lessons that we're learning from the time of Dawud salam we could apply it today? We could have more peace and harmony. We could have more wisdom in our discourse today if we follow this advice of Dawud that was given to Dawud salam that you know you need to judge. You have to look at all sides. Uh, you have to uh, you know finding the truth sometimes is a process, and you shouldn't make judgments uh you know so uh quickly okay so foolishly so half-heartedly and what can we do to correct our mistakes so you know if we do make a mistake and we are all fallible we, we can all make mistakes then what is the process how do we turn to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay and uh and then if we go on to the following ayat if we look at uh, Ayah 26, Allah SWT says about Dawud al-Islam. O Dawud, verily we have placed you as a, as a successor on earth. So a leader, a representative of Allah SWT, of the deen of Allah SWT on earth. So judge you between men in truth and justice. And follow not your desire, for it will mislead you from the path of Allah. Verily those who wander astray from the path of Allah shall have a severe torment because they forgot the day of reckoning. Okay, so here in this ayah, what, can, what are the lessons that we can get? Judge with truth and ju uh, justice and don't follow the lust of your heart. Okay, don't follow the desires of your, uh, of your heart. Okay, truth and justice. That is the basis of judgment. Okay. Because following your desires will mislead you. And if we're living uh, in the area of social media, we're probably, we're, basically we're living in the era of desires. We're living in, in an era of opinions based on desires. And this is very different than a judging with truth and justice. Because truth is based on on core values and principles which rarely change and justice uh, uh, demands to truly have bring a matter to justice it demands that you make proper investigation it demands that you give the person who has no voice elevate their voice and give them a voice so if we look at for example the way that media portrays uh, stories. It's very quickly. You know, you look at the news cycle. It's very, very quick. The news cycle. They make. It's not. Uh, it's not bringing a sense of justice. But why do I bring the media more uh, specifically? Because we're also living in an era where you have this mob justice. We're living in an era where uh, you're being judged on the court of public opinion. You don't have a chance actually to be judged in the court system. Uh, you need to be judged what you you know what's what's judgment rendered upon you in the court of public opinion. So uh, this is the era that we uh, that we're living in, and unfortunately, because of the way that uh, we are portrayed in the media, stories are portrayed in the media. Because we don't have this sense of justice, the Muslims have received the short end of the stick. The Muslims have often uh, been uh, unjustly. Uh, portrayed uh, in the media because no one bothers to ask the Muslim side of the story. The Muslim voice is often drowned out by uh, other uh, other people and their narratives. Okay, so now uh, let's 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 go back for the Muslim now because we get our strength again. Our strength is not going to come from the media. Our strength isn't going to come uh, from uh, you know. 
pandering. Our strength isn't going to come from money. Our strength isn't going to come from materialism. Our strength is going to come from our core values. Our strength is going to come from all this knowledge Adam. So everything that happens is not uh, in vain. Historical events, uh, what we face today, Nothing happens uh, just uh, without any purpose. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, uh, in the following ayat, we're staying with Surah Al-Sad, in the following ayat, uh, if you look at uh, ayat 27, and we created not the heaven and the earth and all that is in between them without a purpose. That is the consideration of those who disbelieve. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that everything that we have created has a purpose there is uh, an intent behind that because oftentimes what happens with the muslim we look if we look at it from a secularized view both historically and our current events we may not appreciate the uh special position of those who have iman we may not appreciate the special position of those who have principles and are willing to sacrifice that for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the following ayah, so in ayah 28, he says, Shall we treat those who believe and do righteous deeds as the mufsidun? Okay, so those who uh, uh, like those, so those who believe with those who associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or shall we treat uh, the muttaqun, okay, the ones that are pious and God-fearing and God-conscious, uh, similar as the fujar, the criminals and disbelievers and the wicked. You know, because oftentimes, many young Muslims might look at their life and say, I'm trying to do good, but is it worth it to do good? Because I see many other people who are doing haram, they're not considered criminals, they're, they, they may be considered very good people within society, is it worth it for me to do what I'm doing? Was it worth it for uh, Muhammad al-Fatih, as we, as we spoke about uh, in an earlier podcast, was it worth it for him uh, to try to fulfill the hadith of our Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa And here clearly Allah is comforting the believers and telling us to look at the, your life, your current events and history with a different lens. Look at it with an Islamic lens that those two things aren't equal. The people who believe, the people who follow the commandments, those people who try to do good works, they are not equivalent to those people uh, who do evil works. And uh, in uh, in that same surah in Ayah 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and to Dawood we gave Suleiman, how excellent a slave. Verily he was ever uh, off the returning in repentance. Okay? So uh, the... Uh, the fact that he was uh, excellent, the, the fact that he was successful was the fact that he was constantly repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was uh, coming back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is the definition of success. If you look at our Rasul Sallallahu in a hadith, he says that I've, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in one version 70 times a day, I ask Allah for forgiveness. In another version, uh, it says 100 times a day, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness. So repenting, asking for forgiveness, is a uh, trait of uh, success of somebody who is successful asking for forgiveness repenting to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's a very powerful trait okay and when we look at our own history our own the history of our own life we truly won't attain success unless we repent unless we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and then when we look out at our, all our blessings, when we look at the Ummah, everything that it was blessed with, whether it's the Ottoman Empire, whether uh, it was um, uh, the Ayyubid uh, you know, Empire, whether it was uh, the Khilafah Rashidun, whether it was the Umayyad, the Abbasid, the Mamluk, whatever era that you know uh, you see uh, the muslims attaining a level of success we know it was because of a blessing of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when we look at the era of science and technology 800 years so like you, know, you could say the past 200 years uh, you know the europeanized european and europeanized countries 
were the ones that you could say are the le- uh, have led in uh, a lot of the science and technology. But prior to that, prior to 200 years, let's times that by four, when the Islamic world led in science and technology for 800 years, for 800 years. And perhaps we lost that lead. Perhaps we lost that uh, that leadership role because we were not grateful to the na'mah, to the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving us all this this hidayah, this guidance, um, this knowledge of all this different science and technology, okay? Because it's a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If, you, if, we, if we look at uh, Surah Al-Anbiya and uh, we look at uh, Surah Al-Saba, Ayah 10 to 11, and Surah Al-Anbiya, Ayah 80, we look at the fact that, um, you know, Dawud al-Islam was given iron, he was given armor for warfare. Uh, he was given this technology, okay? Uh, we made, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we made iron soft for him. Okay, and he was able to make this technology, these these uh, coats, uh, these the the these uh, these chain link coats of uh, armor, and um, you know he was uh, you know he was able to advance in this. Okay, and so why did he do this? So that he could be grateful to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Okay, he said, "Are you not grateful?" The Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala asked after he's bestowed. Uh, all this upon uh, his messenger, he asked him, are you not grateful? Are you not grateful? So if we separate our hearts and our minds away from each other, if we separate our iman from uh, from how we view the world, this is basically an internal uh, colonization. You know, if you look at the one of the purposes of colonization, as we discussed before, was to divide and conquer, was to separate uh, the Ummah into different pieces so that it would become weaker and easier, able to uh, split amongst the different European powers. And so they were able, so they could uh, rule over these different lands in a much easier way. And today we see many of that happening in different ways and forms, uh, divide and conquer, division. Whereas the Ummah, like even today, like if you look at the approach that many Muslims have, you know, many, some Muslims, they'll only care about certain issues. So they'll only care about, say, okay, what's happening uh, to black people. Certain Muslims will only care about what's happening to Palestinians. Certain Muslims will only care about what is happening to the Uyghur, you know, the uh, Muslims in China. You know, some will only care about the Kashmiris, some will only care about the Iraqis, you know, some will only care about the Somalis. You'll only care about a certain group, uh, certain individual, but but that's not an Iman-based perspective. You know, to compartmentalize, to section yourself. So internally, if you start to uh, compartmentalize yourself and internally you, you start to uh, divide yourself, okay, so you separate your Iman from your from your senses then you actually don't get the full benefit of your senses so if you know the the secular person says no you got to take god out of the way you view the world of how you view uh and you know you, you you study the world okay you're actually looking at the world in a more restricted way you're looking at a world not completely you're not you don't understand the uh the complexity you're actually looking at it from a very from a tunnel vision actually that's why like uh Rubay bin Amr uh one of the sahaba radiallahu anhum who uh engaged with Rostam the uh one of the uh, Persian leaders so during the Khilaf of Umar bin al-Khattab uh he sent uh Sa'd Abid Waqas and you know the sahaba uh, to uh, take over these Persian lands. And so when Rubay ibn Amr was like negotiating with Rustam, the leader of the Persians, he says, we have been sent here to take you from the constriction of this dunya, okay, to the vastness of this dunya and the akhira. You know, Islam is supposed to give you a more comprehensive view so that you're actually truly be uh, able to uh, utilize your senses to the full extent. You are truly able to appreciate history you are truly able to appreciate current events and be able to look at it in, in a different way that's why when Hudayf ibn al-Yaman radiallahu anhu is asking Rasul about the evil he's asking about it so that I can look at it from an Islamic lens not for trivial purposes not for salacious purposes 
oh wow, like this is like a horror story, or like you know, a lot a lot of times people want to sit around a campfire and tell gin stories. Why do they want to hear gin stories? You know, why do they want to hear, or why do people want to hear like the signs of the hour? It's more for like the the fear factor. Okay, it's more just uh, you know to get the adrenaline going for uh, the, this this tale for the entertainment purpose. Oh, you know this uh, you know this uh, you know this is why people watch maybe like scary movies and horror movies and things like that, right? So for that type of purpose. But the reason we know about the jinn, the reason why Hudayfa bin Al Yaman is asking about uh, the evil that will come and how to deal with that evil is. Uh, is so exactly so that how, how we can deal with it from an iman based perspective and that's the reason why he's asking about it okay after this period of evil you know will we have a period of good okay yes this period of good it's going to have a defect in it that means it won't be perfect and i remember uh talking to um one of my shuyukh and i was uh, he, he was uh, explaining this hadith to me and we were talking about uh current events and he mentioned, like, uh, you know, a lot of times people, they get depressed because they look at our, their current situation, for example, like avoiding interest. It's very difficult to avoid interest completely or to avoid a lot of things that are cl clearly haram within the Quran and the Sunnah. Okay, it's, it's, it's sometimes uh, for, for many Muslims, it's uh, very demotivating. Like, you know, it's, um, it's hard to, con uh, to come to terms. That we have all this that we're supposed to be, we're told in the Quran, the Sunnah, Halal and Haram, and then our lifestyles is sometimes so contradictory. How do, how do we come up? How do we come to terms with that? He said, Subhanallah, look at the guidance of Rasul. A time of good will come, but it'll have a defect in it. There'll be defects. So it won't, we, like, even, like, we, we won't get back, like, that time. That's why the generation of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, was so perfect and so beautiful. And that, you know, if we are going to, uh, the, the things that will misguide us uh, it, it are going to be people who would, could even be from our own culture, our own nation, because our Rasul said they'll look like us. Okay, they'll be from our progeny. Okay, so they can be from the same nation, they can be from the same family. But our, uh, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, is saying that uh, you need to hold on because why, why are they misguided? It's because they left. The tradition of the Quran, the Sunnah, and the way of the Sahaba, Allah And you need to stick to a jama'ah that holds on to that. And if you can't find that jama'ah, then avoid, like, avoid, you know, everyone. Stay, stay away from this fitna. Okay, avoid all the uh, all these different, uh, you know, types of sects and so forth. Okay. So if we look at the colonial objective which is to weaken the Muslims. We know that there was specific planning to weaken the Muslims. Today, what is happening to the minds of the Muslims? Are we, uh, are, are our minds strong minds? Are we looking at things through a, an Islamic uh, perspective? Okay, or are we looking at things from a way that uh, other people want us to view historical events? Okay, so for example, when we look at history, uh, there will be a big criticism on Islamic empires and how they took over many lands. There'll be a big criticism about that. Oh, look at how the Islamic Empire, Ottoman Empire, all these different empires, they took over different lands. But that same level of criticism won't be levied on other world powers. So as if Islam was the exception, Islamic empires were the exception. And then uh, you have, you know, many people almost having to always explain themselves and have this guilt-ridden conscious. And we have to be, uh, we, we have to explain our dean, we have to explain our history, we have to explain how we look, we have to explain our value. We have to always be exp uh, explaining that. Why? Because uh, we, we allow ourselves to be put in that position because of the weakness of our iman. If we have strong iman and we, we have critical thinking, then we understand that... The world has always worked like that, including to this day. Including to this day, this is how the world works. Is that empires are either expanding or they're contracting. And if they're not expanding, they're on, if they're on, on, on the direction of contraction, they're on the direction of extinction. Okay? And if they're expanding, they're, uh, then they are uh, pre preserving their society and uh, they're... Uh, uh, you know, solidifying their uh, place in the future. 
Okay, so they're giving themselves a future by the expansion of their empire. So if we look at the Persian Empire, it survived by expansion. When no longer expanding contraction, then you saw that it come to an end. Uh, you know, Roman Empire, so forth. And today we see the same thing. Like, you know, uh, are are we are we so naive to uh, understand and appreciate just because you don't have like necessarily a physical wars and battles to take over lands that people's lands aren't being take o taken over and people themselves aren't being exploited uh, you know are we so naive to to, uh, to not understand and, and and not see that and if you actually read a lot of noam chomsky's work he'll uh, you know he elucidates why for example uh, uh m many western governments specifically united states have uh and, and you see that also at the end of uh the way that the colonial powers conducted themselves is that there was a policy now of not necessarily taking over that land but just having the control that you want within that particular land to be able to exploit it okay and that it was much more cost effective to have uh military bases strategically placed and have sympathetic and rulers that collaborate with you within different lands than actually occupying those lands themselves because that is far more expensive and far more chaotic because when people uh, know that they're being occupied, they're much more resistant, okay? So are we so foolhardy to see that if you look at, for, uh, you know, the, there's this criticism of uh, say, for example, Turkey, say they, they criticize the Ottoman Empire. Well, Turkey does not have over 800 foreign military bases in European countries uh. and Western countries, okay? There's no Muslim country who has foreign bases in, 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 in non-Muslim countries, non-predominantly uh, Muslim uh, majority countries. They don't have that, right? But United States, they do. Uh, France, they have foreign bases, but the United States, they outweigh everybody, okay? Russia, uh, you know, uh, they have uh, foreign bases, but if you look at it, United States, uh, they uh, eclipse everyone, over 800 uh, foreign military bases all over the world, okay? Uh, so, you know, let's, let's come to terms with it. Let's understand world history uh, properly. So as we approach the Ottoman Empire, we talk about um, you know, what uh, what they accomplished. They weren't a perfect empire, by no means. Remember, when we look to our example, we look at the Khulafa Rashidun, okay? As an example, the, the, those Khulafa as, uh, as a guide for um, our, our, our deen or, or our values and so forth. But when we look at Islamic empires, there is a lot of good that we can actually learn from. We can actually learn and benefit from a lot of the good that they were able to uh, accomplish okay so let's talk about uh uthman uh, uh ibn Urtughul. okay so uthman uh the one that the ottoman empire is named after and why is the ottoman empire okay why is the whole empire named after this man why wasn't it Urtughul? why was why was uthman the person the one of the sons of Urtughul? the one that the empire is uh, is named after because he set the tone for the success of the ottoman empire he set the tone for it firstly by his characteristics by his character and secondly by the core values and the constitution by which they should operate okay not unlike the methodology uh, of uh, the Sahaba, as we see the Rasul and the Sahaba, those first few years in Mecca, our Rasul is setting the character, building the character of the Sahaba, key core Sahaba. So we see from Mecca, this is where the Khulafa Rashidun came from, right? Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, uh, Ali, عنهم, they're all coming from Mecca. These great characters, okay, uh, these great Sahaba, these great examples uh, for us to try to ascribe and try to live by. And then when they established the first Islamic city, Medina, okay, then you have the Sahifa, the constitution, the ideas, the principles of how the society should operate. And it sets the foundation of how this like, 
uh, Islamic, uh, you know, seed that was planted will become one of the biggest empires in history. And, and to this day, uh, we see the strong presence of uh, Islam and Muslims. So let's look at firstly the character. So, uh, so for the remaining portion of the podcast, we'll concentrate on the uh, character of Uthman. Okay, the and then we'll talk about uh, the values that he left his son uh, Orhan uh, with uh, afterwards. So, what were what was the constitution? What was the advices? What was the nasiha that he left uh, his son with after to build this uh, Ottoman society? So, firstly, he was known for his uh, bravery. Okay, uh, he. Uh, would uh, be fighting the Byzantines. So uh, if we look at um, the Crusaders that he fought, uh, he led the soldiers himself into battle. Okay. And he would be able to, uh, you know, uh, one after another, uh, be able to overcome these different Crusader ar armies. Okay. So he was, they, they sent from Bursa, Madinus, uh, Adranus, Kata, uh, Kestala, uh, all these crusaders were, uh, they would send different armies to fight him and he would lead our armies himself uh, to uh, repel them and take over their lands. Okay. He was uh, known to, uh, to be a very wise leader. He was known for his wisdom and he stood with Sultan Al-Adin, uh, the Roman Seljuk, to help uh, you know, uh, his efforts in conquering many of the Byzantine fortresses. And he was so liked by the Seljuk ruler at that time. Remember, it was the Seljuks that gave them the foothold, that gave the Ottomans the foothold. But they came, the, uh, the Ottomans, uh, they came in favor with uh, the Seljuk, the Romans part of the Seljuk Empire. And they... Uh, they respected Uthman so much that they actually put him, uh, his name on their currency. And in the Masajid uh, at Jum'ah, they would uh, have the shuyukh make a dua for him. This is how respected he was. He was known for his sincerity, his ikhras. He was known for his steadfastness. So he conquered Ketta, Lafka, Aq Hisar, Qawj Hisar in 712 after Hijrah. Uh, he conquered Kabwa, Yakija, Taraklawa, Tikrar, Bikari. And in 716, uh, after Hijra, uh, he conquered Brusa. Uh, and it was, Brusa was led by a man by the name of uh, Aruknus. And uh, Aruknus was a great leader and it was a very formidable opponent. And it took many, many years for uh, Uthman to be able to conquer uh, this particular um, Byzantine city and a fortress and stronghold. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in the Quran, uh, O you who believe, Ya yuladina aminu sabiru wa sabiru wa rabitu wa attaqullaha la'alakum tuflihun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, O you who believe, endure and be more patient than your enemy and guard your territory by stationing army units uh, and, and, and guarding and fear Allah so that you may be successful. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he telling the believers, that you need to be patient and endure and compete with others in patience. Because just because you are Muslim, just because you have Islam does not mean that uh, people are just going to make a way for you. That the sea is going to sp uh, the split for you. Even the sea when it split for Musa a.s. Think about how many years he had to be patient. You, you understand what I'm saying? Like we're looking for the seed just to split for us, the people just to make way for us, just for this miraculous thing to occur and uh, we will have victory. But sometimes because we put in the effort, like well, how much effort do you put in? A couple months, a couple years, a couple days, a couple hours? How much effort for the sake of Islam do you put in? And uh, are you patient upon that? Do you think that it's deserving now after a few hours, after a few years? What What do you think? So one of the key characteristic traits of Uthman was his love for da'wah, to calling people to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this man, as I mentioned, Aqrinas, uh, or Aqrinas, he was the emir of Brusa. So Aqrinas, he was the emir of Brusa, and uh, he was so impressed by the character of Uthman 
that he uh, ended up accepting Islam. And he became like a da'iyah. He became a big proponent of Islam. And Uthman gave him the title back. Uh, and he uh, was uh, known to have this uh, prominent role within the Ottoman state. And generally speaking, many Byzantine leaders uh, and, and many people w within their lands became Muslim because of their uh, characteristic traits of uh, Uthman and the tone that he sent and, their, and the people generally speaking. And it's very similar. If you look at the Sahaba, عنهم, they were very, very few, very few uh, people. And for there to be such a mass, massive influx of people coming into the fold of Islam and staying Muslim meant that they truly believed in the message. It wasn't under compulsion of force because first to leave from an Islamic perspective very clearly, and this is very clear, accepted, uh, mainstream doctrine, widely held doctrine that you cannot compel somebody to become Muslim can only invite them. How come there was so few Sahaba, but given the ratio of the Sahaba to how many people accepted Islam was so huge, the Sahaba did not have time and they didn't have modern technology to be able to re reach so many different people. You didn't have like uh, a state you know, television broadcasting channel to reach so many people or radio or any of these things. People, they were so enamored by the character of the Sahaba. They love their character. Like if you talk, if you go, you know, subhanAllah, you uh, go to Turkey, go to Pakistan, go to Somalia, go to uh, North Africa, uh, go to uh, Dagestan, go to, uh, you know, I I India, go, go to any of these places where Muslims are. And they, the way that they talk about the Sahaba to this day, People are in love with the character of the Sahaba. If we are in love with the character of the Sahaba 1400 years removed from their life, think about how much the people loved their character to see people like that, to see people who were so honest and brave and courageous and had this you know, sense of like mercy and compassion and justice, all of these different things uh, you know, together. So uh, he uh, he attracted many people with dawah, and also he was able to attract many different Muslim groups. Okay, so there was a group known by the known by the name of Ghazjaram. Okay, and they were actually stationed along the Byzantine uh, borders by the Abbasids. Okay, so they were originally uh, stationed there uh, for dawah purposes. Okay, now. Uh, these, this particular group known as Ghazjaram, the defenders, they now allied with the Ottomans, okay, to uh, to help, uh, you know, with, with, with fighting, with helping with Dawa. It was another organization known as uh, the uh, Al Ikhwan, the brothers, a uh, group of, ch they were basically charitable people, mainly uh, traders, so they were mainly businessmen. OK, who uh, would trade and uh, they actually offered their wealth and their business services uh, in in helping with the Dawah. So they would help build Masajid. They would help build uh, hotels for people to stay in. Uh, so basically like a room like uh, like this uh, uh, place where they could have some room and board, you know, inexpensive or free. So uh, they uh, were uh, basically allying with the Ottoman Empire to help them. Uh, for dawah purposes. So one thing that we can see here uh, in dawah that makes dawah far more effective is when your dawah is inclusive. When your dawah is inclusive. And that's maybe something that we can work on uh, as well, inshallah ta'ala, with many of the Islamic organizations, is to make the dawah uh, inclusive. Now, when I say inclusive, the extreme version of that is that you can have any aqidah, you can believe in any like a mutated form of Islam, and that's all good. Okay, I'm not. We're, we're not talking about that. We're talking about uh, just like Ahl so many different organizations, so many different masajid, there's so many different Islamic schools, masajid organizations, youth groups, and everyone is living like on their own little island. They're living on this like little island and they think like they um, are the best thing for this ummah. 
uh, since the, um, you know breaking your uh, fast with dates. Okay, so they think they're the, they're the only and they're the best. And the DAO is not very inclusive. It's like okay, we're doing our thing, and there's there's very little collaboration. Sometimes we do have to a certain extent, but the the level that we should have when we have uh, so many who have basically like we believe in Allah, Muhammad Rasulullah, we have the 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 same values, major issues, we're on the same page. Yet, why aren't we so inclusive and being able to benefit from the different resources and talents? that are uh, uh, located or that the, that the ummah has within itself, okay? So here we see that he had a love for da'wah, and that love for da'wah was very inclusive. It, it brought many different Islamic organizations and groups together to help within this unified front. And that made them actually, that was a very intelligent thing to do. That made them more effective in their da'wah because not everyone can specialize. So for example, you have this group that's used to dealing with the Byzantines, you're allying with them, so now you benefit from their experience. You have this group of businessmen, maybe they know how to build things and uh, you know launch business projects. They're able to benefit from them. You, you, you know what I mean? So it's very, very inclusive. So, uh, it was a very good strategy and a good characteristic trait by uh, Uthman. Another trait that he was known for was his sense of justice. And uh, actually, his father uh, initially made him a judicial authority in Qura Jahisar. So this was uh, around 684 after Hijra, uh, 1285 CE. And uh, he made him obviously because he had this characteristic of justice. He was a just person. And uh, during his tenure, actually, uh, he judged in favor of a Byzantine Christian against a Turkish Muslim. Okay, and so the Byzantine Christian was, you know, very surprised. He, he, you know, he was taken aback by the fact that he judged uh, in his favor. And so he said, why did you judge in my favor, knowing that I'm not a follower of your religion? And so Uthman, he said, rather, how could I fail to judge in your favor when Allah, whom we worship, commands us, Allah commands us in this ayah in the Quran, Surah An-Nisa, ayah 58, Allah commands you to render back your trust to those whom they are due. And when you judge between people, judge with justice. So this man was so impressed by this characteristic trait of justice, of someone being authentic and being just, that he is willing to judge against his own uh uh, his own uh, kin, his well, his own tribesmen, you know, someone from his own religion. Uh, he's able to judge against them because it's uh, because it stood up for justice. And again, that's the way of the Sahaba, right? That's the way of our Deen. This is the guidance that we have uh, in, in the Quran. During the Khilafah of Ali bin Abi Talib, uh, uh, Ali bin Abi Talib, he uh, actually saw a Christian man wearing what he thought was his armor. So he went to the, he, he brought his dispute uh, to, he could, so Ali bin Abi Talib, remember, عنه, he's a Khalifa, he is an army. Uh, he can come and just take, this is my armor, give it to me. But he goes to Shuray, a, a Muslim judge, and he says, I need you to judge between me and this man. I believe he has my armor. And so, um, you know, he he brings uh, you know the, the the two people together, this Christian man Ali bin Abi Talib, and he uh, you know asks Ali bin Abi Talib, uh, what do you say about um, you know? So he listens to what Ali says, and then he says to this Christian man, what do you say about uh, what the Amir al muminin says about you? Okay, and so the Christian man he says, this is my armor, and I do not consider. Amir al muminin to be a liar, but he says, I, this, is, I, this is my armor. So the judge, uh, he goes to Ali bin Abi Talib, he says, Ya Amir al muminin do you have any evidence? Do you have any proof? And so uh, Ali, he, he laughed, you know, Ali bin Abi Talib, he laughed. He says, actually, I don't have, Shuray is correct. I, I don't have any proof. Like I can't prove that this is mine. So this Christian man took his armor and he started to walk away. So the, because the judge ruled in the favor of the Christian. And so when he does, uh, does this, uh, he comes back. So the Christian man comes and he walks back. Uh, 
And he says that, as for me, I testify this is the wisdom of the prophets. Amir al-Mu'mineen himself has taken me to his judge, and his judge has ruled against him. And so what does he say? Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. So he at that moment at that moment uh, he uh, accepts Islam and he says that uh, he's by Allah wallahi this armor is yours. Because I followed you after the battle of Siffin and your armor fell from your luggage and I took it. So he admitted it. He said, you know, your armor fell from your luggage. I took it. And uh, and so this is yours. So Ali bin Abi Talib responded by saying, if you have uh, embraced Islam, this, you know, this is yours. Here, take it. This is this is for you. So this is the type of justice that we should aspire to. Again, looking at history from a lens that we can appreciate that uh, then we can decipher because I want you to think about it. If you look at it from a secular perspective, a secular perspective should necessitates that uh, the more materialistic gain you can make, the better, right? Because you no longer have uh, a moral constant. It's everything becomes morally relative. You know, time, circumstances, whatever, it can it can continuously change. Everything becomes morally relative, and we see this day in and day out, day in and day out. You have these people, for example, in the United States. I believe they're part of what's called the Lincoln Project. They're criticizing Trump. So all these people are Republicans that criticize Trump, never Trump campaign. You know what's interesting? is that these people themselves are war criminals. So they're saying never Trump, okay? We, we Republicans against Trump. We need to get Trump out of office. He's done too much. But these same people were the ones that uh, made false pretenses uh, to make this war in Iraq. And they exploited uh, Iraq and given, uh, you know, contracts to Halliburton, and these government contractors and it just decimated and killed and just like we're talking about uh, levels of injustice, war crimes, genocide. And now all of a sudden the, the, they're, they're becoming media darlings because why? Oh, never Trump. Oh, we all hate Trump. You know, what is this? You know, did you have a sense of justice, uh, you know, back when you were trying to wage war, bloody war on Iraq. And now all of a sudden, okay, Trump, he's not, he's, he's, he's hurting my bottom dollar. Maybe I have investments in China or somewhere else. And he's hurting, uh, hurting that. So again, we, we, we should appreciate how we view history. Okay. We need to uh, appreciate how we uh, view history. Uh, he had a sense of loyalty. He had a sense of loyalty. He held his word. Uh, again, a, a trait that we need to bring back, that sense of loyalty. Your word means something. His word meant something. His word meant something. So uh, there was a Byzantine fortress in Ulubad uh, that surrendered to the Muslims. And so one of the terms of surrender, they said that you know no Muslims should cross the drawbridge. Okay. So he... Uh, kept that agreement and he made sure that any uh, one who would come after him would also keep that agreement. Allah SWT tells us in Surah Al-Isra, Ayah 34, and fulfill every engagement, for every engagement will be uh, inquired on the Day of Judgment. So this uh, encapsulated, right, this encapsulated uh, the uh, you know, the, the the way that he would treat people, like, you know, the, the type of authenticity that he had with himself. And his devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in his conquest. Like, he was a person who was truly doing things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there was a reasoning that he was doing whatever he was doing, whether he was building his, uh, his, his empire, his state, uh, his community, his society. There was a driving force behind that, and that was to worship Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. So, Ahmed uh, Rafiq, who's a historian, 
uh, says about Uthman. He says, Uthman was extremely uh, religious. And he knew that the propagation of the message of Islam was a divine duty. Uh, he possessed a vast range of strong political thoughts. Uthman never founded his state on the love of authority, but rather for the sake of spreading Islam. That was his main driving force. Was not just not just for this expansion, but it was for uh, the sake of Islam. Like he wanted to give the message of Islam to everyone, and uh, we should appreciate that initiative because that's the initiative that was the driving force, which caused the Ottoman Empire right to have that momentum. You know, you see like a lot of movements when it initially starts it's very close to the purity of its ideals what we don't understand what we don't appreciate is that even though materially we don't see the greatness of that empire until you know sometimes decades or centuries later what we should appreciate is that those ideals were the driving force of whatever came afterwards, whatever good that came afterwards. So for example, the purity of the ideals of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, that was the driving force of everything that came afterwards, all these benefits that came in the uh, Muslim world afterwards. Because uh, that's what, if we look at it, they didn't have material uh, resources. The you know they were lacking in in having uh, whether it was a, a geopolitical experience or having a military or any of these different things, but it was those it was those ideals. Like if you look at for example Uthman, uh, he's taking on an empire that's huge, that's massive, that has several nations, uh, that's backed by so by well established armies, and and he was just. Within a generation, they were just immigrants. They were migrants running away for, for, you know, for their lives. But look at the strength that Iman gave them. Iman gave them strength to have confidence in themselves. And say we are worth something. We, are, we, are, we uh, have the right to believe in what we believe. And we have a right to make our mark. Because, you know, sometimes the, the, the immigrant mentality is that you feel defeated, you don't feel self-confident, there's self-esteem issues. But look at the, uh, the confidence that Iman gives you when you, when you believe in uh, these types of uh, ideals. So, inshallah, uh, in the next episode, we will discuss his advices that he gave uh, to his son. And this basically forms, you could say, the constitution. This, uh, uh, this forms the ideological framework for the Ottoman Empire. And we'll see it's from this ideological framework. That's, it's actually, that's what gave the Ottoman Empire its foundation. Not uh, military. These all things come afterwards. Advanced military, uh, you know, advanced knowledge and centers. And if we look at, you know, later on in history, like, you know, uh, or later on as we move through history, we see the advancement like in, in schools and hospitals and educational institutions and universities and, and judicial centers and all of these different things and economy. We see all of these different things, but that didn't give it stability. It was the framework. And the evidence for that, again, is if we if we recall the last podcast, is when they lost their identity, when they lost their ideological framework, it collapsed. It completely collapsed. So, inshallah, we'll continue uh, next uh, podcast and we'll talk about the advices that he gave his son, uh, Orhan. And uh, we'll go into details of how the, 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 the lessons and the deep meaning behind those advices that formed this constitution, this ideological f framework for the Ottoman Empire. And uh, thank you for tuning in. We ask uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to benefit from the lessons of history. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, look at both history and current events through an Islamic lens. We will see you all next time. Remember, we want to live by the haq. We die by the haq. 
And just when you think life is stuck, tune in to Life Haq. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Do I feel that the New York police are providing enough protection or do I have to have protection of my own? I look for protection from Allah.